you have philosophers at every turn when you're trying to arrive at some conclusions here. And at what point will you be evidence-based and no longer will the philosopher in the armchair be useful to you because all of your answers are coming from the lab and not from their brains? Neil deGrasse Tyson and co-hosts Chuck Nice and Gary O'Reilly have a conversation with neuroscientist and author Anil Seth, and they are talking about consciousness in today's video, which I think is fascinating, and it touches on, this is a longer video on the Star Talk uh, channel, which you can check out for yourself. It, it, it's about an hour. We're going to do just a piece of it in this clip, and I will probably do another clip out of it. Um either later today or soon, because I think it's really, really interesting. But I'm going to have thoughts that I'll add in as we go, and then I want to know what you think in the comments. Why don't we check it out together? The hard problem of consciousness. And, but is it like a three-body problem and unsolvable? Does it even exist? Uh, is being transhuman our future? So you're thinking about the future of our mind. Mm, totally. And... If so, will we be able to upload our consciousness and exist forever? And how will that feel or not? When we eventually travel into deep space, are we going to come across alien life forms that are super intelligent, artificial intelligence, or are we going to find a biological life form? Um, there's a lot of people think that our future will be AI and will exist as AI. But that's a discussion that we're going to get into with our guest today. And our guest is Al Seth, uh, a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex in England, a place I know reasonably well. So he speaks your language. Then. Mm. Yes, he does. So you have to pay attention. Um, <laughs> so PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence, a writer and author whose most recent book, Being You, was published in 2021. So Neil, please, Al Seth. Wow. Uh, but delight to have you here, uh, Anil. Uh, Anil. Anil, I say that right? That's exactly right. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Excellent. Excellent. So all these topics, you know, everyone, you, you can't shake a stick without having it land somewhere where somebody is deeply thinking about consciousness and everybody thinks they've got the answer. So it, le it leaves me to ask a pretty basic question here. What is it we're using to prove to ourselves that consciousness even exists as a thing that could even possibly be uploaded to a computer one day. Oh, well, there's a lot of questions within that question. But I mean, people don't even agree on that. I mean, there's, there are some philosophers who might call themselves illusionists who think that consciousness <laughs> doesn't really exist in the sense that you and I or... <laughs> If you ask anyone on the street, might might assume that it does, that we're just mistaken that there's anything special about this thing that we call conscious experience. And I think I think they're just wrong, frankly. I mean, there are many things in consciousness we can't be sure whether we're right or wrong. But if you think about it, the only thing we can be really sure of is our conscious experience. Now, everything else is kind of inferred through it, whether it's the world around us, the self, or everything else we know in science. It's sort of we, we know it because at some point we experience something. Uh, and so there is a there there to explain. Consciousness, I think, is real. There's a difference between you know, being awake and aware and being completely out under general anesthesia. I think most of us would agree that some things in the world are conscious, at least some of the time, other, other people, some other animals, and some things are not, like tables and chairs and and objects. And there are other things where there's a great deal of uncertainty, like um, some other animals, insects, people after brain damage, and of course, you know, hot topic today, artificial intelligence. The extent to which you define consciousness in the way you just did, if AI then exhibits all those properties, you would have to then concede that AI is conscious. And what I have been finding is every time AI hits another threshold, another goalpost, people move the goalposts again. And that makes sense. <laughs> that, 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 that doesn't make sense. I, I was going to say, it, it, it makes sense. If you, the, the closer AI gets to being truly conscious and sentient, the more we become less special as who we are. So we got to keep moving the post. Right. So you have to raise the bar so that we can maintain our supposed preeminence. So 
But I, honestly, and I, I'm not, I don't have the intelligence to match toe to toe with these guys, but I would also say that there's just an element of complexity, right? In other words, you can talk about an insect or a hive mind. Um, and they're all sort of, they seem to be operating on fairly straightforward code, right? You don't see a ton of three dimensional creativity out of an ant say, because they're so busy doing their thing, their ant thing. AI can be remarkably complex as we're seeing, and it, it can do an effective job of mimicking and regurgitating in, in increasing complexity patterns that resemble human. But what we haven't seen yet, and maybe we are approaching this, is something that seems truly original. And then I guess you can <laughs> take another toke of your joint and you could say, well, you know, what do, what do humans do that's truly original? But um, complexity is the word that floated to the top of my mind listening to these talk, these guys talk. And, you know, how much of our definition of consciousness is just to, so that we feel special. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think quite that that's a profound point. And it's, it's driven a lot of confusion about our relationship. I mean, you'll know this, Neil, as an astrophysicist, right? I mean, the, the thought that we are special was what led people for the longest time to think that we're at the center of the universe. So under- oh, oh, plus it kind of looked that way. <laughs> you know, in all fairness, <laughs> standing true. on Earth, the whole universe revolved around us. So it wasn't completely in conflict with evidence until it was. That's all. That is, that is true. And then, of course, Darwin did something similar with our nature as creatures, pointing out that we're also not special in the sense of being created by God in a different way from all other, all that. we're related to all other animals. And so, yeah, in that sense, consciousness is sort of the last refuge of human exceptionalism. <laughs> Beautiful sentence. <laughs> that you know, we feel that human consciousness is somehow really special and it sets us apart. Uh, you know, Descartes, made this very explicit. He called non-human animals uh, beast machines or, or bet machine in the French. Mm. Um, and trying to make the point there that non-human animals were just flesh and blood mechanisms, robots made out of living material that didn't have the kind, at least didn't have the kind of consciousness that matters for, for moral consideration. So we do have this track record and we've kind of got around it in, in most ways now. We no longer think we're at the center of the universe. We no longer think that we're unrelated to all other creatures. And we, most of us, I think there's a wide consensus that we're not the only conscious creatures out there. Uh, just ask your cat. Ask. Yeah, that, that delineation, based on my earlier comment, that moral consideration, right? If you have a pet, if you have a dog or your cat, it's, it's hard to argue that there's no personality there. But do they think, do, do animals behave in ways that could be considered a moral? A cat, yeah. <laughs> if you could ask a cat. You can ask a cat. They just won't answer until you've <laughs> left the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, are there theories of consciousness? And, I, you know, I've seen a lot of isms out there, right? Dualism, monism, materialism. Are these all ways to try to get into this mysterious place that is our mind? They're all ways of thinking about the problem, or they're sort of things that come before the theories. They're philosophical theories. So consciousness seems to be this incredibly mysterious thing, because on the one hand, we are physical creatures. We're made of stuff, and complicated stuff, but it's stuff, um, or it seems to be stuff anyway. And on the other hand, there are conscious experiences. So intuitively, it might seem that the physical world is very different from the world of conscious experience and that no explanation in terms of physics and chemistry will tell you how or why anything or anyone is conscious. This is what David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness. And I know he's been on, on your show um, before. And, and the idea that they're totally unrelatable is, is dualism. They operate in separate realms. And you've got a whole bunch of other isms, but they're not really theories. They're the sort of perspective that you might take from which you might then build a theory. Let me interject there. When someone comes up to me and says, uh, Dr. Tyson, I have a theory. And I say, no, Einstein had a theory. You have a hypothesis, <laughs> just to be clear. Because <laughs> in the physical science, a theory is a fully tested explanation of phenomena that makes successful predictions. I, I don't know if that's getting semantic about the word theory, but many people say, oh, it's just a theory without recognizing that at least in the physical sciences, a theory is the highest form of understanding we have. 
No, I think that's right. I think a theory is the goal, isn't it? And, or a, a well-tested and empirically well-established and explanatorily powerful theory. That, that's the goal. And I would say in consciousness, we have proto-theories. There are the beginnings of theories. Some are more ambitious <laughs> than others, but none of them have reached the level of maturity that we've seen in physics with relativity, quantum mechanics, all of, all of these things. Now, I mean, they are, they are still theories. So they make predictions and they explain observations about you know, what happens in the brain. Because one of the amazing things about consciousness, philosophically, it seems incredibly mysterious, but it has this amazing advantage that brains are relatively numerous, relatively accessible, you know, compared to the the Big Bang or the the very small world of quantum mechanics. I mean, we can we can look inside a living human brain as people gain consciousness, lose consciousness, change their consciousness. So we can study it in in a sense much more easily than some of the other frontiers of mystery. And that's great because then we can begin to use this evidence to constrain and, and improve the theories that we have. You talk about it as a myst- mystery. Um, is consciousness broken down into different kind of s- types, segments, or, or is it just one big thing? I, I prefer that kind of divide and conquer approach, actually, uh, because if you treat it as one big scary mystery in need of one massive eureka solution, it, it, it can be very resistant. It can be resistant in, even in the sense of what would a satisfying answer look like? You know, what, what would we be content with in terms of an explanation? And in many other areas of science, this kind of divide and conquer approach has, has, has paid dividends. There's a good parallel, I yes, think, with, with the history of life. It's, it's reductionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but let me add something here. The, in, in early days of physics and uh, all the branches of physics, uh, philosophers played very important roles to help shape questions and help the direction of things. But that was evidence that the field was still in its infancy when you had philosophers sort of running amok among you. And it looks like you have philosophers at every turn when you're trying to arrive at some conclusions here. And at what point will you be evidence-based and no longer will the philosopher in the armchair be useful to you because all of your answers are coming from the lab and not from their brains? I think philosophers are in it for the long game with consciousness. And one of the things I've seen over the last 30 years that I've been doing this stuff is, is the dialogue between philosophy and, and science has become richer. Certain things that may have started purely philosophical have now become you know, the realm of the lab. And, and that's great. Yeah, that's how most things would be. But once it's in the lab, the philosopher is a little less useful, is all I'm saying, because your answers are coming from the lab. I think the point, right, certainly the point we're at right now is that philosophy is still extremely useful because we're still a bit confused about what the questions we should ask are and how to interpret the answers and the theories that are coming Mm -hmm. up still have quite a philosophical flavor and also the the implications are hugely important and they will remain philosophical like yes we can have an understanding of what happens in the brain when someone loses consciousness or so on but what do we do with that understanding what do we do with our understanding of consciousness in terms of how we treat other animals how we treat um, brain injured humans, and indeed what we do with AI. It's always going to be. A All way. right. So th- this is absolutely fascinating to me. And I, I realize that this is a, basically a, a politics channel where we talk about politics and there isn't explicitly politics in this uh, clip, but uh, I've done a number of uh, other videos with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, talking to other, you know, um, here's Morgan, for example, or, or Bill Maher, people who talk politics and ask him political questions. And not only do I just have a sweet tooth for the science talk of it and the rationality talk of it in this crazy world, it's like a breath of fresh air, but I've kind of really gone down a rabbit hole with Neil deGrasse Tyson himself. So that's why I'm, I'm doing a channel that is kind of apolitical, but I also think because I feel insane in today's political environment, it really feels like we're living in a construct, like that things can't get crazier and then they do. So the, the topic of consciousness and how we are wrestling with, uh, you know, the, these big questions, uh, is, does feel political to me in, in the time that feels otherwise absolutely crazy. Um, but I, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm definitely going to do more videos on this clip. It's called Neil and Anil Seth 
discuss consciousness in the universe. It's on the Star Talk channel if you want to go look up the whole thing. I'm going to do at least one other clip from this because I'm really enjoying it. But let me know what you think in the comments.